Welcome to TV Glimpse. In this recap, Season 3 of The Crown. If you want to watch the rest of the recaps, click here. Season 3 of The Crown introduced a new cast of actors. It covers the span between 1964 and 1977. We are picking up with our new Queen Elizabeth in 1964, which technically isn't that long after Claire Foy's rendition of the monarch. But a side-by-side -side comparison of portraits of past and present queens officially closes one chapter and begins another. The relationship the Queen is really worried about is hers and Wilson's. Her suspicions doesn't exact make for a successful first meeting, and the death of Churchill only cements her fear that the times, they are changing. But he's about to read her words. After the MI5 headquarters in London get a call from the CIA, they learn that yes, there is a KGB mole hiding in plain sight in the British establishment, but it's not Harold Wilson but Sir Anthony Blunt. We at least also get the likely conversation between Blunt and Prince Philip, during which the Queen's dutiful husband threatens to throw the spy in jail if he puts one toe out of line. Unfortunately, being a spy and all, Blunt has just as much dirt on Philip. Remember the proof of offer? Philip would rather nobody did. Which is why Blunt is ultimately offered immunity and peacefully continues as the surveyor of the Queen's picture until his retirement in 1972. England, in need of financial help, finds their previously close American ally drifting away. President Johnson won't take calls from England after Prime Minister Wilson wouldn't support him in the Vietnam War, and he turns down an invite from the Queen for a weekend of shooting at her Balmoral residence in Scotland to smooth things over. After reading headlines, President Lyndon Johnson has a different idea. Princess Margaret should visit him at the White House. The Queen may be a better diplomat, but Margaret is a socialite. She starts off the night by insulting the late President John F. Kennedy, challenges Johnson to a drinking contest while dancing, singing, and when all is said and done, she leaves at 4 a.m. having secured the money. Sometimes, a little indelicacy does the trick. The Everfine disaster took place on, on October 21, 1966, when heavy rainfall caused a spoiled tip five times revelation height to avalanche to the village below, destroying a school and other buildings, killing 116 children. The Queen, who refuses to visit the deadly scene because it's not her place, and even after Prince Philip and Tony paid their respects to the victims, remains resolute in her desire to stay out of it. She insists that her presence will only paralyze the relief effort, and route she's encouraged to display emotion, and she tries. After meeting with the victim's family, she's pictured whipping away a tear from her eyes. She later reveals to Wilson were actually bone dry. She laments to the Prime Minister that she's never been able to weep when necessary, and even poses that there's something wrong with her. It's time for Prince Charles to make his official debut. Every future king begins as a Prince of Wales, but this time around, the place wants to send their heir to Wales itself in order to learn enough of the language, so he can give the official investiture speech in Welsh. After being in Wales for quite a long time, his affection for Wales grows. That prompts him to go rogue in his investiture speech. Because the whole thing is in Welsh, his mother doesn't notice when he ends up slipping some lines about respecting Welsh identity in there, earning him nods of approval from the crowd. However, the Queen does eventually acquire a translation of the speech and is livid when she sees that her son has done. Her anger isn't necessarily about Wills, but because she knows a small part of him was talking about himself. Charles reminds the Queen that he has his own voice, but unfortunately for him, she shoots back. No one wants to hear it. We finally came to Princess Anne, Prince Charles, Camilla Shan, and Andrew Parker Bowles. They were involved in a love we can say rectangle. At first it seems simple, Charles is meeting with Camilla, until he informs Mountbatten that the reason she's back on the market is because she and Andrew had a falling out after Andrew started seeing Anne. Charles and Camilla have a casual date night and it prompts a conversation about his dissatisfaction with his family and turns into a discussion of the fact that the Duke didn't really abdicate because of love for his now wife, Wally Simpson, but because of his frustration with the establishment. The Queen heads out on her trip to France, which gets interrupted by the message that the Duke isn't just ill, but close to the end. He's able to perk up enough to praise the Queen for all her work, and reveal that he and Charles have been writing letters to each other, telling Charles, what a king you will have made in a kinder world. Charles writes in one of the letters, promising that when it's his turn, he will wear the crown on his own terms and make his great uncle proud. 
He is distracted by thoughts of Camilla, his recent phone call with whom, unbeknownst to Charles, future Andrew lurking in the background. Which is why we should all be concerned when he tells Mountbatten that he needs to his help introducing Camilla to the family as the one. Mountbatten isn't going to do that. Instead, he goes into full problem-solving mode and has a meeting with the Queen Mother about putting stop to this romance. And later corroborates in one of the best scenes of the season, Charles can only marry Camilla if he's prepared for there to always be three in the marriage. Camilla is still in love with Andrew, which is why it takes only a conversation between the Queen Mother, the Shans, and the Parker Bowls to set a wedding date. Mount Bottom breaks the news to Charles, who can barely believe it, even when he hears it from Camilla herself over the phone. However, she drops the news that this wasn't entirely her plan. He lives for his posting, knowing his family once again interfere in his love life. It turns out love is in shambles all across the royal family, and now it is Princess Margaret's turn for heartbreak. Margaret loses her cool when people can't stop praising her cheating husband. She leaves the room in a huff and escapes for, week, for a weekend away with Anne. What begins as a trip into town turns into a full on love affair, where somehow Margaret and Roddy are photographed together on the beach. She points out that this means that she and Tony can finally be together properly, but he can give up on his wife and children so easily. He waits for Margaret to return to their shared home, which she does with Roddy in tow. The two argue intensely, with Margaret reading the cruel notes Tony leaves for her in her books and Tony escalating things so intensely that Roddy ends up slinking away. Tony warns Margaret that if she runs after Roddy, he will file for divorce. She does it anyway. But Roddy is gone from her life for good. Margaret, distraught, overdoses on pills, and while the Queen Mother waves it away as a cry for attention, Elizabeth rushes to her sister's side. Margaret is stable and recovered enough to inform the Queen that she and Tony are getting divorced. Well, this is all for season 3. Hope you enjoyed this recap. Don't forget to watch all the recaps here. Thanks for watching TV Glimpse.